Hey everyone, my name is Sean and welcome to Speech Leech, where I learn a language that you, the audience, vote for based off of four choices. And today, beginning with the letter E. I'm sorry for the time that I took off of the project, but now we're back, at least for the time being. Unfortunately, it's really hard for me to predict exactly when I'll have time as I'm preparing for my final year at university and have a million other things to worry about right now, and so the consistency of the videos will almost certainly suffer. And there will probably be more of these random breaks in the future, and I'm sorry for that. But we are gonna finish the alphabet. It's gonna happen. At some point. And another quick thing about the honorable mentions, the filler week where I basically just talk about other random languages beginning with the same letter that I couldn't include in the previous episode. I think that now it's gonna be potentially shortened to honorable mention, just because I think a good video about one obscure cool language in depth would be less messy and just kind of better than three to four languages that I just brush over really quickly. I'll leave a somewhat updated rundown of the rules and stuff in the video description below, in case you want to look at it. One last thing before we get started, voting will continue on on Instagram as usual, but I will also be making a YouTube poll, because it is a YouTube thing after all. In any case, enough about me and more about languages beginning with the letter E. First off, the Estonian language, also known as Estikel. If you don't know anything about Estonia, know that it's one of the chillest, figuratively and literally, places in Europe with beautiful nature and wonderful people. They invented Skype, online voting, and one of the most addicting candies in the world. If only the language was as welcoming as the country. You may have heard about this before, but there are plenty of websites online that claim Estonian to be one of the most difficult languages in the world to learn for English speakers. Now, while true that it is unforgivably difficult for English speakers to learn, that claim is always absolute bullcrap, because have you met many English speakers learning Estonian, but also Pijanjara, Nuhal, Kornho, and can compare? I doubt it. The difficulty of any language is extremely subjective and depends on what your native language is. Estonian would be a piece of cake comparatively for Finnish people just because the languages are quite similar and from the same language family. Really going off topic here, back to the matter at hand. Estonian is native to Estonia, spoken by about 1.1 million people, it's part of the Finnic branch of the Uralic language family and is written using the Latin script. Estonian is the sole official language of the country of Estonia as well as one of the official languages of the European Union. Estonian is not an Indo-European language, but rather it is part of the Uralic language family, with its closest relatives being Finnish, but also Karelian, Ingrian, Livonian, a few other smaller ones like the Sami languages, and also very, very distantly being related to Hungarian, and also some languages of the Ural region of Russia, like Udmurt, Hansi, Moksha, just to name a few. Now, while it may be unsurprising to learn that there are plenty of Russian loanwords in Estonian because of Sovietsky Soyuz, it's interesting to note that nearly one-third of all Estonian vocabulary is based off of Germanic languages like German and Swedish because of the heavy influence over the centuries. Though you most likely won't recognize them right away because they do a pretty good job at Estonianizing them. For example, Kol, Roim, Siras. Also, interestingly enough, Estonian shares a bunch of random words with Latvian due to close proximity to each other, but also because of them both being a part of Livonia for centuries, as a religious order, a confederation, a voivodship, duchy, kingdom, more on that in a future video. Some examples of these include Maksat versus Maksma, Maya and Maya, Naba and Naba. Also in Estonian Aita is thank you, while in Latvian Aita is sheep, and also Aita is father in Basque, I think? Anyway, the reason Estonian is considered to be so difficult is because of its 14 grammatical cases. Technically 16 if you include prolative and instructive, but those are quite rare. So depending if you're on a book, in a book, from a book, without a book, the book is going to have a different ending. And then 10 of those more. Well, 12. It's also going to be different if there's more than one book. Adjectives have to agree with that as well, and there's a million exceptions. This does mean that the basic SVO word order may be sometimes ignored, because thanks to grammatical case, the words may be strung around however and whatever, and you won't lose any meaning. Not sure if that makes the language easier or more difficult, rigid structure versus loose structure, but it definitely makes the language much more fluid. Curia te Next up, the Esperanto language. This is a very interesting one, and the first, and probably the only, non-natural language to be included in this series. Esperanto is officially classified as a constructed international auxiliary language. Basically, a Polish guy named L.L. Zamenhof created it in 1887 with the idea of making it a universal second language for the entire world to use, and through it, foster world peace. He intentionally made the language super duper logical and easy, with zero exceptions, so that anyone can pick it up relatively quickly. Unfortunately for Zamenhof, and perhaps the rest of the world, the experiment kind of failed and it never caught on an international global scale. 
Despite this, there are still plenty of people around the world today that actively still use it. The official community of Esperanto speakers around the world is called Esperantuyo, kind of like Francophone and Anglophone, but Esperanto. Estimates of the number of total speakers around the world vary wildly, from 60,000 to 2 million. And there are supposedly a few thousand native speakers of Esperanto, so families who speak it at home, which is pretty cool, but pretty weird to think about. There are also a ton of organizations promoting Esperanto usage around the world, such as the Universal Esperanto Association, the Academia de Esperanto, and the World Esperanto Youth Organization, just to name a few. There's also this amazing program called the Pasporta Servo. Essentially, it's like an updated directory that lists all of the people of Esperanto culture from around the world who are willing to offer free homestay to other Esperanto speakers, kind of like Esperanto couch surfing. Esperanto is truly a worldwide language, and here's just a few examples of the random places that it's used around the world. The town of Herzberg am Harz in Germany came to be known as Esperanto City, because there are so many Esperanto enthusiasts there and there's even bilingual signs. The International Academy of Sciences of San Marino uses Esperanto as its primary language of instruction, and students have to write their thesis in two languages at the same time, Esperanto and their native language. This is because the first and most important principle of the academy is the absence of any cultural and linguistic bias, not only in scientific content, but also in the teaching of this content. So they use Esperanto because it's a neutral language. Some secondary schools in China, Hungary, America, UK, and Australia offer Esperanto classes. There are even these two unrecognized micronations that made Esperanto their official language. The Republic of Malosia in Nevada, USA, and the Republic of Rose Island near the Italian coast in the Adriatic Sea. Then there's the whole neutral Morsnet thing, a tiny 3.5 kilometer stretch of land on the fringes of Belgium, where in the early 1900s there were a bunch of initiatives to create an Esperanto-speaking state there called Amikeo, meaning place of friendship, but that's a whole other crazy story, just look it up. The list goes on and on, but one question still remains. What is Esperanto? Well, it is a constructed language with many rules to it, though it was made to deliberately be super easy and super logical to learn, with zero exceptions, unlike literally every natural language out there in the world. The sound inventory is mostly based off of Slavic languages, while the vocabulary is mostly based off of Romance and Germanic languages. Which might be one of the reasons why it never really caught on on a global scale, because it's seen as very Eurocentric. And it's made in a way that you can create a ton of new Esperanto words, kind of like German does it by gluing words together, thanks to its extensive system of prefixes and suffixes. Let's try reading some. Chui homoi estas denas ke liberai, kai egalai lauo, digno kai raitoi. Ili posedas ration kai conscienson, kai devus conduti unu la alian en spirito de fratezzo. But for now, we're moving on to the next language, and that is the Edo language, also sometimes known as Bini. Edo is native to the Edo state of Nigeria, it's part of the Volta Niger branch of the Niger Congo language family and is written using the Latin script. The Edo language is the primary language of the Edo people and was the primary language of the Kingdom of Benin, one of the oldest and highly developed states in West Africa. Note not to be confused with the current modern day Republic of Benin, which as far as I can tell has absolutely no relation to the Kingdom of Benin, which is even more confusing because the current capital city of Edo state of Nigeria is called Benin City. And yeah. Anyway, Edo is part of the Niger Congo language family, which is the third largest language family in the world in terms of number of speakers after Indo European and Sino Tibetan. And the largest language family in the world just in the number of languages, about 1,500, which constitutes approximately 21% of all of the world's languages. Now, due to the sheer amount of languages in the area, and the area itself being quite rural with a bajillion tribes and groups of people and crazy dialect clusters, it's hard to tell exactly how many people speak standard Edo. Estimates usually range from around 1 to 1.6 million people, but some sources say that if you include all the Edoid languages together, which is just a, an umbrella term for all of the dialects together, native and second language speakers, the number could be as high as 25 million people. Also, Edo is the first African language to be a candidate on the series. Yay! Not only that, but Edo is also the first tonal language to be a candidate in the series, what an achievement! Which, not gonna lie, sounds a bit intimidating to me because out of all the crazy, wild, obscure languages that I've attempted to study ever, I've actually never ever attempted a tonal language before. Except that one time when I was a kid I tried to learn Mandarin, but I gave up very quickly on that. Edo has three tones. Low tone, presented with the grave accent, high tone, with the cute accent, and a falling tone, with a circumflex accent. There's also technically a mid-tone, which just means no tone, so it's unmarked. Though, for some reason, I have to say that a lot of websites that I found for Edo, when teaching it, completely ignore the tone, 
which as a potential beginner learner after this video seems a bit frustrating to me. Like why? Another thing that I just couldn't ignore and had to mention, I gotta say, is that th there's this website called edofolks.com, title written Comic Sans, so you know it's good. It has these weird ads for these weird books, I assume written by this guy, and you can have an ad on there too if you want for the measly sum of $500. Like, <laughs> let's try to read some Edo. I'll probably butcher this pretty terribly. Ve oye he ob ota uru ese. Moving on to our last language of today, but definitely not least, the Evenki language, also known as Evaduituren. What a beautiful flag they have, by the way. Just, just a good flag. With just about 16 to 26,000 people, Evenki is the largest member of the Tungusic language family. Note, do not confuse Evenki with the Even language, a different Tungusic language. The two were related, but not mutually intelligible. Evenki speakers stretch out over a very large area. Some speakers may be found in the northeastern part of China, specifically in the Inner Mongolia and Heilongjiang regions. In Russia, there used to be the Evenki Autonomous Okrug, but in 2007, a bunch of other Okrugs and regions merged together and created the absolutely massive Krasnoyarsky Krai, and that's where the Evenki mostly live. Traditionally, the Evenki were, and to an extent still are, nomadic reindeer herders. As a result, they have a very large, like disturbingly large amount of words for specific types of reindeer. Let me give you a few examples. Remember, these are all separate distinct words with I assume different etymologies. Reindeer, wild reindeer, reserve reindeer, reindeer which became wild, reindeer harnessed on the left hand side of a sledge team, castrated reindeer, not completely castrated reindeer, reindeer without horns, one-year-old reindeer, two-year-old reindeer, two to three-year-old reindeer, less than one-year-old male reindeer, and it's estimated there's a total of, a, of over 150 of these terms. Like, anyway, in Russia, Evenki is written using the Cyrillic script, while in China, it's primarily written in the Latin script. Nevertheless, it is also sometimes written using this really cool vertical Mongolian script, the only script out there to be written up to down. Unfortunately, Evenki is an endangered language. It's not gonna die tomorrow, but the decrease in speakers is very noticeable. In 1998, there were approximately 30,000 ethnic Evenki in Russia, and only about 10,000 of them spoke the language. Then, in 2002, there were approximately 35,000 ethnic Evenki in Russia, and only about 7,500 of them spoke the language. The situation in China seems to be somewhat better. In 2009, there were approximately 30,000 ethnic Evenki, and out of them, about 19,000 spoke the language. And there's also about 3,000 monolingual speakers, which in today's day and age is really impressive, especially in China. Evenki is a tough language. It's highly agglutinating, which means a million prefixes and suffixes glued together like a string to create a very specific meaning. Add to that 13 grammatical cases with very complex grammar and a somewhat complex phonological system, and you've got yourself a very difficult language. Also, by the way, the word shaman came into English and probably other European languages from Evenki. All those different people groups from these regions are still quite heavily into the, all the mystic shaman stuff, which is pretty cool. And that about wraps it up for this episode. Today we traveled through the Baltic flatlands, the marshy wetlands of the African Gulf, the fringes of Russia and Inner Mongolia, and then just kind of went all over the world, because Esperanto. Also, real quick side note, um, I just realized as of recording this outro that I'm not able to create a YouTube poll because you can't create community posts on YouTube if you have less than a thousand subscribers. So vote on Instagram and maybe I'll leave in the description a link to a straw poll where you can vote there for those who don't have Instagram. And yeah, I'll see you all next time and peace out.